It is an oversimplification and just incorrect to say that lipids are either good or bad for us. It is more complex than that. It really comes down to the amount and type of lipids that we're taking into our body. In general, if you're consuming lipids from whole foods and you're consuming lipids mainly from plants, that is probably the way to minimize the harms that lipids can potentially promote if they're consumed in the inappropriate amounts and uh, types. So one main area where lipids do potentially have a role is in the development of cardiovascular disease. And before we go into the specific lipids and how they can affect our risk, it's important to understand a little bit more about what is cardiovascular disease and how it can affect health. So there are many forms of cardiovascular disease, but the one that we typically focus on and the one that causes both heart attacks and strokes is a condition called atherosclerosis. And I kind of drew this out before when we were talking about LDL. And basically atherosclerosis is when we have an artery in our body that gets blocked, gets clogged, with all these fatty substances. And that's what we're trying to show here. These are the fatty substances that are clogging an artery. And this is actually a real view, a real picture of atherosclerosis. And the artery should be nice and open like this, but you'll notice that it's been quite narrowed. And all this area here, that's gonna be fatty substances that are lodged in my artery wall that are narrowing the lumen, narrowing the space that blood and other important things, well, blood in particular, but all its important contents can flow through. As I mentioned a couple modules ago, another big problem is sometimes if we have a narrowed artery and then something gets stuck there, like a blood clot, then we have a complete blockage and if we have a complete blockage, then blood can't flow, oxygen and nutrients can't be delivered, and that's what leads again to a heart attack and a stroke, a stroke happening in the brain, a heart attack happening in the heart, okay? So things that increase the risk of atherosclerosis, these are things that we wanna minimize. So physical inactivity, obesity, stress, these are all things that increase our risk of atherosclerosis. Diet also plays a role. So as we learned earlier, diets that are higher in soluble fiber, that diets that are higher in plants, diets that are higher in whole foods, these are associated with a lower risk. Also, certain lipids can affect our risk as well, and that's what we're gonna explore in this section. Like we've mentioned earlier, there's lots of debates when it comes to nutrition, but there's no debate when it comes to trans fatty acids and their effect on cardiovascular disease, okay? Trans fatty acids increase the risk of cardiovascular disease more than any other nutrient. They are known to increase the amount of LDL in the blood. Remember, LDL can deposit in my artery walls. They increase the risk of cardiovascular disease and they increase the risk of cardiovascular disease mortality. We want to minimize the amount of trans fatty acids in our diet. How do we do that? If we minimize the consumption of processed foods or don't eat them at all, if you don't eat processed foods, you honestly don't have to worry about trans fatty acids. They're only found in processed foods and especially in those that have the word hydrogenated on the label. So we wanna minimize that. And luckily, um, as we talked about in chapter two, Canadian health policy has really gone to great lengths to really alert the public of the dangers of trans fat, but also to slowly get it out of the food supply. So we're going to see less and less of it in the food supply, which is a great thing. Now, when it comes to saturated fatty acids, there is an association with cardiovascular disease, but to be honest with you, it's still being explored to some extent as well. And there are lots of debates on exactly how and if saturated fats increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. We do know what has been shown is that a diet high in saturated fat increases LDL, okay? And remember LDL, low density lipoprotein, that's that lipoprotein that can deposit into the artery walls, narrowing them and increasing the risk for atherosclerosis. However, so you would think if saturated fats increases LDL, and we know that LDL is associated with heart disease, then you would think that saturated fats have been shown to lead to heart disease and, and heart disease mortality. 
a direct link has not yet been established. It doesn't mean it, it doesn't exist. It just means that the research is still trying to understand this relationship better. As a general rule of thumb, it's probably better to reduce the amount of saturated fat in your diet and increase the amount of unsaturated fat. Easiest way to do that, I sound like a broken record, eat lots of whole foods and eat lots of plants. If you're consuming more plants than animals, you're probably going to get your fatty acid profile in the right, um, in the right proportions to promote overall health and reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease. Now, when it comes to polyunsaturated fats, like those we find in vegetable oils, a general rule of thumb is we want to replace saturated fats, like we just talked about, with more sources of these PUFAs. And when, instead of saturated fat, we consume more polyunsaturated fats, that can lead to a decrease in LDL, which we believe can potentially lower our risk of cardiovascular disease. Also, if we're consuming more PUFAs, polyunsaturated fatty acids that are essential fatty acids, so remember those with the fatty with the double bond at position three or six, these can potentially have some other roles in, in affecting our risk of cardiovascular disease. Okay, so remember that essential fatty acids are typically categorized as omega-3 or omega-6 fatty acids. Omega-3 fatty acids have been believed for some time to decrease the risk of cardiovascular disease and that's because the eicosanoids that they form, these hormone-like molecules they form, are associated with a number of cardioprotective benefits like reducing inflammation and reducing blood clotting. However, you would think, okay, omega-3 fatty acids, they kind of reduce these negative cardiovascular effects. I should start supplementing them. I should start popping omega-3 pills. However, we have yet to find enough evidence to support supplementation, taking like omega-3 supplements to reduce the risk of cardiovascular events. A rule of thumb is just to get a lot of these naturally in the diet. So by eating uh, cold water fish, cold water fatty fish, flax seeds, ground up flax seeds as well, walnuts, these are all good sources of omega-3 fatty acids. Now, omega-6 fatty acids, the eicosanoids, the hormone-like molecules they form, these have long believed to increase our risk of cardiovascular disease because they increase inflammation and blood clotting. However, newer studies haven't shown a clear relationship. And again, remember, in nutrition, we're always putting together pieces of the puzzle. This puzzle isn't clear yet. Okay. So again, get a bunch of whole foods. That's a good recommendation in general. And there might be a cardioprotective effect. There might not be. But again, if we're just getting our diets full of whole foods, we probably don't have to worry too much about this. What's interesting, kind of a side note to cardiovascular disease, is both omega-3s and omega-6s are being studied a lot for their potential to be protective on brain health. We know that infants and developing fetuses have an increased um, need for these omega-3 fatty acids and omega-6 fatty acids because they're really important in the development of what's going to become the brain. Um, supplementation and, and adequate intake may also help to improve overall brain health in older people and reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease. And I say may because these are relationships that do show supportive evidence, but we're still researching the relationship between the two. But again, eat a lot of fatty fish, eat a lot of nuts, or eat a decent amount of nuts, eat a lot of whole foods, and you're probably going to get all these benefits. Now, a lot of people are very scared of cholesterol, and quite honestly, cholesterol's gotten a bad rap for a long time, needlessly. Remember that we need cholesterol. We need cholesterol to make certain cholesterol-derived uh, molecules like uh, vitamin D, like estrogen, like testosterone as well. However, yes, when cholesterol levels in the blood are high, it does seem to increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. But for most people, eating cholesterol doesn't have too much effect on our total blood cholesterol because our liver can make cholesterol as well, and it'll change its cholesterol production depending on what we're taking in. Okay, so for most people, eating a lot of cholesterol doesn't actually raise their blood cholesterol or their LDL, okay? However, there are some people, about 25 to 30% of people, who are believed to be high, cholesterol hyper responders, meaning that 
if they eat a lot of cholesterol from their diet, they're going to make a lot of, um, they're going to have a lot of cholesterol in their blood and a lot of LDL as well. For these individuals, we would actually recommend moderating the amount of cholesterol in their diet. How do you do that? Again, easiest way is to eat more whole foods and in particular to eat more plant products. We really only get cholesterol from animal products. So if we're eating lots of plants, we're probably not going to get cholesterol in an amount that can potentially be harmful to health. Which brings us to a question I often get in nutrition is what about eggs? You know, it feels like one day eggs are good for you, then they're bad for you. Who knows? Well, a good place to start with a discussion of eggs is to talk about how incredibly nutrient dense they are. Each egg has only about 70, 75 calories, and they are high in protein, they're high in fat, they're high in vitamins, they're high in minerals, and they are like super packed with nutrients for the amount of calories they have. Plus, due to a Canadian researcher out of the uh, University of Guelph, some eggs also are a source of omega-3 fatty acids. By actually feeding chickens flax seeds, the chickens take those flax seeds and metabolize some of the lipids in them to form omega-3 fatty acids, which we get, they posit it in the yolk, and then we get those when we eat the eggs. However, eggs are also really high in cholesterol, about 225 milligrams per egg. And usually the upper limit, when there is an upper limit, Canada doesn't have one, but the States does, when there is an upper limit for cholesterol, it's about 300 milligrams a day. So if you're eating two eggs, you're well above the upper limit. So you would think, okay, well, cholesterol, so remember that cholesterol, dietary cholesterol typically doesn't raise blood cholesterol for most of us, but for some people it does. So the question becomes, is eating egg going to increase my risk of cardiovascular disease? Okay. Studies have shown that in moderation, about one to three eggs per day, in general, and at the population level, eggs do not seem to increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. However, if you are concerned about it, consuming no more than one egg a day, this will definitely get you below the upper threshold for cholesterol if you're worried that you are a cholesterol hyper-responder. That being said, if you're a little less worried about being a cholesterol hyper-responder um, and your blood lipids are all in order, for most of us, egg consumption can absolutely be part of a healthy diet. In fact, they're one of my favorite breakfast foods, actually all-day foods. Who says eggs just need to be for breakfast? So remember, sterols can come from both plants and animals. And there has been a belief that plant sterols um, may reduce LDL because they compete with cholesterol for absorption. And in fact, Health Canada permits claims on foods that are high in plant sterols saying that they have an association with reduced risk of cardiovascular disease. However, newer evidence suggests that the, the relationship with, between plant sterols and reducing risk of cardiovascular disease, it's not as clear as we thought it would be, okay? So whether consuming plant sterols leads to a reduction in cardiovascular disease mortality just because it reduces LDL, this is not black and white. That being said, where do you find plant sterols? In a bunch of plants. So if you're eating foods that are high in plants, again, again, you're probably going to get your plant sterols and you're probably going to be getting less cholesterol in your diet as well. I don't know about you, but I find it hard to keep track of which lipid affects cardiovascular disease risk in which way. So that's why I made this slide that summarizes the main types of lipids and their potential effect on cardiovascular disease health. But an important thing to remember is that we're always still researching these things and new evidence keeps coming to light. This is what the puzzle looks like right now. But as we do more research and learn more about the effects of lipids on different parameters of health, this picture might change slightly. But again, if you are worried about lipids in your diet, consume mostly whole foods, consume mostly plants, and you're probably going to be a-okay when it comes to lipids and your risk of disease.